All right, we're back with another lecture here. Uh, this one, this time, is from section 4.1, and it is on exponential functions. So we've looked at uh, we've looked at polynomials quite a lot. We've looked at uh, rational expressions quite a lot. And towards the beginning of this class, we did look at um, did look at powers of exponents. So this should be a little bit of review in some cases, but it's going to be a little bit more difficult, uh, I think, because we're going to be adding in some variables now, and we're going to be looking at graphing these things. So without further ado, I know the last lecture was a little bit long. We're going to get into this exponential functions. Okay, section 4.1. An exponential function is some function that's like this. So we take a number, any any real number it can be uh, it can be it could be negative uh, we're not going to handle functions like that just yet we're going to handle just positive numbers now so we're going to take any number a bigger than zero and that's going to be our base okay so we'll pick a number bigger than zero and that will be our base if we oh and we should not pick one by the way if we pick one nothing happens so I guess it's still an exponential function but it's pretty trivial pretty simple if we then take this number and raise it to a variable power we get something called an exponential function Okay. This is this is a function that no matter what you plug in for x, you can always tell me what the result is. If you plug in a negative number, well then we know our rules of exponents. We just do this. We flip it. If we plug in 0, we know what the result is. It's 1. Any any non-zero number raised to the zeroth power is 1. If we plug in a positive number, we just calculate that base to the positive power. We can do that. This is, this is a, a function. In fact, it's a function that is 1 to 1. So that's really nice, too. And its domain is all real numbers. That's really nice. Uh, and it's it's actually always non-negative if a is positive. Okay, so f of x is always bigger than zero. It's always non-negative. Okay, now if we throw a negative sign in front of there, like this. Well, then it's always negative. Okay. This is this is a really nice set of functions. Pick any base, raise it to the x power. You're going to have a domain of all reals. It's always going to be positive, and it's one to one. It's invertible. That's really nice, right? If you if you remember some of the functions we've looked at before, they're not that nice. So let's look at a few examples. Uh, common one used in computers, right? You, I don't know if you're old enough, you remember computers with small amounts of memory, right? Uh, nowadays, when you buy a computer and you're, you're looking for memory, <clears throat> uh, you can get something like 16 gigs, or you can get something like 32 gigs. These are pretty common off-the-shelf computers. Uh, or if you're buying a laptop, uh, you might be getting something with smaller 8 gigabytes. Uh, if you're old enough to remember, four gigabytes back in the days of Windows 7, that was pretty common. And prior to that, two gigabytes was pretty common. And I'm not even going to write further to the left because prior to, to that, there were computers with like 64 megabytes, two, two megabytes of, of RAM. But what do you notice about these things? This is two to the first, two squared. 
2 cubed, 2 to the 4th, 2 to the 5th. We could keep going, right? Maybe some of you have really monstrous computers out there with 64, heaven forbid, 128 gigabytes of RAM. That'd be curious. It's just powers of two, all of them. We can keep going. Right? And at some point, we're making this connection, I hope, that this is just two to the x power. Why do we have to plug in whole numbers? We don't. We can plug in any power we want. Right? We can, we can plug in anything we want. It doesn't have to be a whole number. And this is an exponential function. Well, this, this, what I listed, was an exponential series. And so we can graph that sort of thing, can't we? We plugged in one. We got two. So I'm going to indicate these by twos now. So this is by two. And this is by one. So we plug in 1 to our function 2 to the x, and we got 2. We plug in 2, we got 4. We plug in 3, we got 8, 2, 4, 6, 8. We plugged in 4, we got 16, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16. And if we did things like plugging in half or whatever, we would notice that this curve, right, when you plug in 0, what do you get? When you plug in 0, you get 1. 2 to the 0th is 1. So we get this point here at y equals 1, an intersection, that starts growing exponentially here. grows really, really fast. If I go even one further, I go from 16 up to 32. If I go one further again, I go all the way up to 64. This starts growing really quickly, really quickly. What happens with negatives? Two to the negative first, what is that? Two to the negative first is one over two to the first. So that's one half. So let me mark some indications here. There's negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four. Two to the negative first is one over two. It's one half. So that's even closer to the x-axis. Two to the negative two is equal to one over two squared. That's one fourth. This one will be one eighth. This one will be one sixteenth. So this red line as we go further and further to the left, become more and more negative, these values become closer and closer and closer to the x-axis. I can't accurately graph it here. They're just ridiculously close to the x-axis already. All right? If we keep going to the left there, we can get as close to the x-axis as we want. We'll never touch it. At the limit, we will reach it. But that just means that we're as close as we want to be. Okay, So we always have a positive function here. Even if we plug in negatives or zero or positives, it doesn't matter. This is what all exponentials look like. So take a look. It doesn't matter what the, the base is. To the left, they get really, really close to the x-axis. At x equals 0, we have the intercept of 1. And that is invariant. That does not depend on the base. Pick any number. Positive number. Raise it to the 0th power and you get 1. So that y-intercept, it is the same for all exponentials of this form. If you add a number here, you're obviously going to change that. If you multiply this here, you're obviously going to change that. But we know how to handle function transformations, 
so we know how to handle things like that. If you don't, go back and watch a couple lectures ago. We, we handled that <laughs> in last chapter. And then to the right here, the exponential function just starts climbing. It really just starts climbing very, very quickly. This is what all exponentials look like. It is literally what they all look like. Okay. All right. Now there's one thing also. Notice I picked two, and I picked a number bigger than zero. What if I had picked one half? A number between. between 0 and 1. So I picked a number bigger than, than 1. What if I pick a number between 0 and 1? We still get the exact same graph, but it's flipped. Let's pick 1 half to the x. If I plug in 0, I get 1. So that x, you know, 0 to 1 doesn't change. That, that y-intercept doesn't change. But now what happens if I plug in 1, I get 1 half. If I plug in 2, I get 1 fourth. So here on the right, this thing just gets really, really close to the x-axis. And I can't accurately draw it here with my mouse. It doesn't actually do the wiggle that happened there. I can't, can't graph that. But this time on the left, if we plug in negative 1, what happens? That's 2 to the first. We just take the reciprocal. So that's 2. If I plug in negative 2, I get 1 half to the negative 2, 2 squared. That's 4. If I plug in 3, I get 2 cubed. If I plug in 4, I get 2 to the fourth. So we get this. If I plug in, instead of a base being something bigger than 1, if I plug in a base that's between 0 and 1, I get the exact same graph, but just flipped about the y-axis. This is what all exponential functions look like if they're in this form. Okay, so this is, I think this handles, uh, I just kind of got on my soapbox there and kept going. Um, I handled quite a lot of things there from this section. Ah, here's something I didn't. Okay, so one thing to notice here is that I could shift this graph, and I'm going to do that by just shifting my x-axis. I hope that's not too confusing. I can vertically shift my graph, right? So if I graph this, I will erase my blue one. So I'm graphing 2 to the x now. 2 to the x plus, uh, looks like maybe 6. So I've shifted it up 6 values. Okay, the, the, the shape of the curve doesn't change. I haven't multiplied x by anything. I haven't multiplied 2 to the x by anything. I've just added 6 to the end result of our function, 2 to the x. So that means I've shifted the whole thing up. Everything goes up six points, six units. On this left-hand side, I want to identify this here. It levels out, doesn't it? Right? The, the graph doesn't change. It, it, everything's moved up six points, but the graph doesn't change. So this this left-hand side still does not ever come below a certain value. 
it levels out, here I'm drawing the, the old axis again, it levels out at that axis, but it will never drop below it. It will, be, it will get arbitrarily close. You can get it as close as you want, but it'll never get to it. That's something that we call an asymptote. I'll write that word down. This one is, in fact, a horizontal asymptote. You may have heard of something like asymptotic. Something is asymptotically close to something. It means it approaches that. So here we've got this line y equals 6. And our graph approaches, it asymptotically approaches that line as x goes to negative infinity. Okay, that, that's, it's just a, it's just like a, I hesitate to use the word barrier, but it's kind of like a barrier that your function gets really close to. Really, what we're saying is in the end behavior, you remember talking about end behavior of polynomials. In the end behavior, our graph never goes too far away from that. So in the negative infinity case here, our graph always stays really, really close to that line. It never deviates too much. Okay, that's that's an asymptotic property there. All right. Uh, there's another really really common application of exponentials that we need to get into here. So, with that, I'm going to get into something called interest. And, and I'm talking about money <coughs> now. When you when you uh, invest in something, let me uh, let me just talk about something that really briefly. Let's say when you invest in something like let's say you take a hundred bucks for example, and you give it to someone and you're like, hey, uh, if I give you this money and I'll let you have it for a year, how much you know how much extra money will you give me? A lot of a lot of people do that because they can make money from your money, and then if they give you a portion of that. They've still made money. If they give you a portion of the proceeds that they make from it, they're making money, you're making money, you don't do any work for it. <laughs> they do all the work for it. That's like the premise of, of investments. <clears throat> investments usually have an interest rate. Some of them are fixed, something like certificates of deposit. Um, these are fixed interest rates that you're guaranteed for a time. Uh, other things like investments in the stock market, there's no there's no guaranteed rates. In fact, you can lose money, right? Uh, but the average investment uh, over the last ten years for the stock market is I don't know something like something between. I'm going to give a range because I don't want to be wrong. It's something between like five percent a year to like fifteen percent per year. I want to say it's eleven, but I'm going to give a big range. Five to fifteen will increase my confidence here somewhere between 5% to 15%. Uh, that doesn't mean everybody gets that. Okay. Anyway, let's say you take 100 bucks and you invest it at 5%, okay, and you're guaranteed that for a year. So at the end of that year, what do you have? You have 105 bucks. Nice. This 100 you call your principal investment. The five, we call our interest rate. Okay. Let's say we have another year to invest, and so we take what we did last year, 105, and we invest it again. And they give us, again, another 5% interest rate. Now I need to get out my calculator. What does this turn into? Well, 105 times 1.05 is 110.25. It's $10 more. Nice. Well, what if we continue this process? What if every year we have some investment which we are guaranteed 5%? At the end of the year, what you do is you take your money and you put it back in, and you get another 5%. And then you take what you get and you plug it back in and you let your interest compound on itself. 
the interest that you earned in the previous year is now earning interest itself. That's what we call compounding the interest. The money that you made makes more money, and that money makes more money, and that money makes more money, and it continues like this. This is called compounding your interest. It's not the way that everybody invests. Some people take the interest out every year. And so they have a fixed principle where they keep this initial value the same every year, but they take out the interest. And they can, you, can, you can actually live on interest. Um, you claim it in your taxes just like you claim regular income, uh, but you can live on interest if you have sufficient principle. You could think uh, at the end of your life, if you've saved up $200,000 and you decide to retire, I mean, if you, if you earn 5% interest on a year, how much money are you making? 10% well, is 20000 so 5% is $10,000. So at 5%, if you had $200,000 saved at the end of your working life, you could earn what did I say, uh, $10,000 a year just by letting your money sit in an account. Okay, so again, it's not guaranteed. It's not the way the stock market really works. You, you might be able to get CDs, that's a funny joke, at 5%. Uh, anyway. This, this is really something that people do. Okay, this is actually something people do. They invest their life savings at the end, and they try to live off of savings, or at least supplement their retirement income with that. Um, okay. Um, so what are we getting at here? On the left-hand side now, the left-hand side, let's take a look at what was happening. In the second line already, we can see that this was actually $105, right? Which is 105, or 100 times 1.05, that's this. We multiplied it again by 1.05 to get this second value, 110.25. So I'm gonna start a counter here. This was after one year. This was after two years. After three years, if we still had the 5% interest rate, what are we going to have? We're going to have 105, uh, sorry, 110.25 times again 1.05 if we invested for a third year. And I'm not going to write down what that equals. I don't really care. The point now is to say this, is that that 110.25 was really the previous result, which was 100 times 1.05 times 1.05 times 1.05. Now, that's this one. Okay, and all of these are this. Okay. If I kept going, I said, let's let's do this for n years. Do I have an expression for that? On the left, it's, it's a messy product. On the right, what is it? It's 100 times our interest rate to the nth power. We have, in the third year, after the, after the third year, we've got three 1.05s multiplied together. After our second year, we had two 1.05s multiplied together. After our first year, we had one of them. Okay, this is, this is interest. This is how you create a function to calculate how much money you've, you've got after taking a fixed amount of money and investing it at a fixed interest rate for a number of years. Okay. This is a form. This is simple compound interest. In the more complicated case, what happens is you can actually 
get more than one uh, interest payments throughout the year. So let's say uh, T is the number of times uh, it's the number of years, let's say. So here I'm actually flipping uh, some definitions. I apologize for that. T is the number of years you invest your money. P is going to be that principal amount, the starting amount. It's what you start investing. N is going to be our number of interest compoundings per year. In my previous example, there was only one per year. But it's possible that every six months, every three months, every month, or possibly every second of every day. That's called continuous. Uh, you, you can get compounding interest. They, they, they compute your interest at a certain time and then they give you the interest and then you can put that back in. That can happen multiple times throughout the year. So instead of, give, instead of giving you a lump sum at the end, they give you small pieces throughout and they let interest accumulate on each small piece. Okay, That's actually preferable in some cases. Uh, R is going to be our interest rate. as a decimal. So like some number, like uh, I'll say 21% would be 0 0.21. Okay, as a decimal, you need to turn it into a decimal. Okay, so if you've got these variables, what you do is have this function, which you have rather, is this function for the amount after time t years, which is equal to your principal investment times, this is very much like the simple compound interest we had before, there's going to be some expression here which essentially tells you your interest rate, and you're going to raise it to some number of compoundings. Okay, this is just in the exact same form as before, but now the specifics of what goes where is a little different. I'll start with the power. So if you invest something for t years and you get n compoundings in those each of those years, well then there's n times t total compoundings. So in before it was just the number of years because we had one per year. But if you get like two per year, we would have had two n in the pre in our simple example. But in any case, it's the number of compoundings per year times the number of years. Okay. Inside the parentheses, what we had before was 1.05, which was 1 plus our interest rate. So we had before 1 plus r. It's not what we have now. Because you're not going to get that interest rate that they say Usually it's like a yearly thing. They say you get this amount per year. Usually when you get a CD or invest in something else with fixed interest rate, they say like an uh, like an annual percent yield. Like how much do you get per year as a percentage? Um, what that is is really this number here, R, okay, divided by the number of compoundings in a year. What what they do, what is done rather, is you take the interest, like for a, for example, five percent from our last one. If that's what we're going to get through the year for the year, and you get paid compounded four times a year, you can actually take that and split it up that percentage into four different pieces to get paid out at four different times of the year. Okay, so this is essentially the the interest rate you get per compounding, right? Per compounding. Okay, this is this is your investment formula. This is calculating 
non-continuous interest. This formula will tell you the amount of money that you have after investing P dollars for T years at an interest rate of R compounded N times per year. It's confusing, I understand. And you would only ever calculate things like this with a calculator. <laughs> but it's a it's a really it's really kind of a fascinating thing. Um, let me just work out one example. I'm going to use that two hundred thousand <clears> dollar example before. Um, so let's say you take two hundred thousand dollars. That seems like a reasonable amount of money to be able to save up over sixty years of living. Um, it's certainly not a, a, a. It's certainly not billions of dollars. We're not talking about uh, some of the wealthiest people in, in the world here. Um, it's a reasonable amount of money to be able to save up, for sure. Um, okay. But what what sort of interest rate should we look at? Should we look at just the five percent? Yeah. So let's go with five percent again. Okay, and then um, we'll look at just compounding once per year, like we did. Okay. And let's say you retire at 55, okay, and let's say you've got some retirement plan, right, in this in this whole example that I'm working on, or some retirement plan that, that lets you, like, you know, lets you live comfortably without taking this interest out. And so, um, sadly, death is the great equalizer. So let's say at the age of 85, you pass away. But you leave your investment to your your beneficiaries, whoever they are, children, uh, foundation, what have you. How much money are they going to get? Okay, so that's that's a, it's a very common question. My father died uh, in twenty thirteen, and he had some investments. I mean, he could have tried to use this to predict how much he would have had. But uh, you know, this is a very common situation. You, you receive some inheritance, which is the result of somebody's investments. So let's look at this: two hundred thousand at five percent interest for thirty years. Let's forget everything prior to that fifty-five year old time. Let's say that's what you had total interest and everything saved by fifty-five, and that's going to stick in your interest account for thirty years. So T is thirty. N is 1, this is 0.05 R, so we add 1 plus 0.05, raise it to the 30th power, and then multiply it by 200,000. So this is where I said, you would probably never do this by hand, you're probably going to do this with a calculator. So first off, 1.05 to the 30th is 4.32, 1, 9, 4, 2, blah, 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 200,000. Okay? So that's approximately equal to this, 4.32. So that times 200,000. That's 864,388 dollars and, and spare change. Living to 85 is completely reasonable. Retiring at 55 is less so. Uh, maybe this is better if it was 20. 1.05. to the 20th, say you retired 65, it would help if I plug in the right numbers. That's still 2.65 times 200,000, that's 530, so if it was 20 years instead, uh, this, would, this would put us at 530. 
and spare change. Five percent is a very modest interest rate for for mutual funds. Twenty years is a modest amount of time uh, to have something invested after retirement. Uh, so this is this is a completely reasonable example. Two hundred thousand is something that's it's a it's a modest amount of money to have saved throughout your life. This is, I think, a very good example illustrating the power of compound interest. To be able to turn $200,000 into almost a million dollars, to be able to hand off to your, your children or grandchildren or all of them or some good friends or some foundation uh, as a donation, that's that's amazing, right? It's it's uh, it's amazing that it works that way. Um, yeah, there's a lot of people that make a living doing investments and, and handling these sorts of things for people. Uh, and so you can you can definitely get into that. You can. It's never too early to start investing, right? It's never too early to start investing. So with that, we're done. We're done with uh, section 4.1 and. In the next example, we'll be looking at something called continuous investment, which it brings in a whole, well, it brings in another irrational number that we've looked at before, but perhaps not done much with. So with that, I will talk to you later. I hope that helps. See you next time.